Hey guys, all right, while we wait for everyone to get on, I'm gonna go ahead and share this into the group so that more people can hop on and join us. We're gonna be talking a little bit about independent contractors, employees, and my legal recommendations today. Um, so just go ahead and hop on in. If you guys have any questions at all, go ahead and throw them for me into the chat and I'm gonna kick off here in one second as soon as I share these over to my groups. Let's see, Do -do -do. hi guys, I see a couple of you. Go ahead and just comment where you're coming from and tell me what the weather's like because it's actually finally cooling off here, finally. Like I feel like it has been so hot. Um, hey Craig. Let's see. Hey. All right, so people are jumping in. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pause my other stuff and I've shared, let me pull up my notes. Fantabulous, winning life. Hello, hello. Okay, cool. All right. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, there are people who are gonna be trickling in just a little bit, but we are going to talk about independent contractors or employees, and we're gonna kind of differentiate and give you guys a couple of tips for what you can look for, considering the fact that we are actually coming up on year's end here. These are things that you guys need to consider all the time, but I just wanna run through the status, who you need to pay, some recommendations of how to pay, and some intellectual property defaults that don't necessarily always, uh, they're not necessarily what you think. Um, and I just wanna make sure that you guys, the business owners, are safeguarded. I'm not gonna make this very long. I have a lot of legal client calls today, so I just wanna jump in super fast. Uh, first of all, this is a generally, this is not just for photographers, so anybody that is listening that works with other people, whether you have a referral fee program, maybe you are a photographer, you have like a senior rep program, or you're paying affiliates, because maybe you're an online shop. Um, this can even include like when you receive affiliate payments from Amazon. Uh, you are required to remit documentation of how much money that you pay somebody. It's pretty standard and understood that whenever you have an employee, typically in the United States, that's used by a W-2 to report to the IRS, you're going to report all that monies, um, you're paying the employer taxes on it, that's fairly straightforward and that's the most commonly accepted status that people truly understand when it comes to reporting of money and payments, right? Um, the independent contractor side that I just outlined is a little bit more intricate, it's heavy in legal pitfalls, that I see with business owners all the time and that I don't want you guys to have to deal with. Um, so I am going to just jump right into how to determine the statuses. Like I said, employees are really straight and to the point. Most of the time you're gonna have them come in, you're gonna present to them that you're gonna give them a paycheck, you're going to identify them as an employee and hopefully you have a plethora of documents that I'm gonna talk about later on. Uh, that you want to use with the employees. It's more tricky, more tricky, <laughs> it's trickier, it's after lunch here, uh, it's trickier when you have an independent contractor who you start treating more like an employee. Um, you may have started with a, just a couple one-off jobs or they're just affiliating for you or they're just sometimes coming into your office and helping out, but the more and more that you add more control over the tasks that they do, you start treating them like an employee. If it looks like a duck, it acts like a duck, it is a duck, um, that is when you start having a little bit of this wishy-washiness, how do I pay them, um, am I still, are they still at 1099, which is the legal document that you create every year to, to for $600 or more within a calendar year, is that the document I'm giving them, when did we become employee-employer relationship, um, it's really easy on this scale to transfer over from independent contractor into an employee. Um, the first step though is for you guys to sit down and talk, which do you intend to be? Employer-employee, there's a lot more state-required benefits, you're doing those W-2s, you're paying an employer taxes, Independent contractors are more of those one-offs, right? Maybe the one-off jobs or it's someone that's working virtually for you. 
and you're going to pay with the 1099. Uh, so right off the bat, you might want to discuss your intentions across the board with you and that individual so you can determine what you want to be. Um, how to pay these people. Um, I recommend uh, using a system such as like Gusto. There's also ADP and other ones available. I've really started instituting Gusto in my business because it pays employees and it pays independent contractors for me. I can pay myself, um, I can do my sales tax reporting, and I can submit other reports that I need to to the state. It's so user friendly. Um, it's not like a QuickBooks or an accounting system, it is a payment and benefit system. I can track my employer independent contractor hours, I can pay and direct deposit to them through it. Um, I have a link for like $100 off, you guys can like check it out. I think they also have a free trial. Um, I share this with you because I have tried all sorts of systems. I've tried keeping spreadsheets and sending uh, PayPal payments every month. I've tried using other things that kind of connect with QuickBooks and also, uh, and they haven't really been as user friendly. So I really strongly recommend you guys check out Gusto. And again, I have the link available um, that you can take a look at to see, uh, to get the $100 off. But I share that to say that that covers you on either of these statuses. So it also makes it seamless if you have somebody that's moving from one status to another, whether by choice or I just start having more control over them um, as the boss and they end up becoming an employee just by action. Again, remember the test is the more control, um, the more likely they're going to be considered an employee and they could receive benefits under that. Uh, it really is important for you guys as the business owners to keep a pulse on this for multiple reasons. Not just with taxes, um, that is a big one. If it is found that you're calling someone an independent contractor but you're treating them like an employee, you can get pinged by the state, back taxes, late fees, fines, and all that sort of stuff. You don't want to go down that path. Um, another thing is to say you have a couple of employees and you've been treating this other person or calling this other person an independent contractor and come to find out by action they're actually an employee. They are in potentially entitled to some of the um, benefits that the other employees have. Maybe you're contributing for yourself to like a SEP IRA um, or one of the other IRA plans and it's required that you offer that same benefit to all employees. So that's just some of the pitfalls to think about. The second one is when it comes to payments. Um, I love Gusto because I don't, this is gonna sound weird since I'm always pitching that professional services are worth what you pay for, um, but uh, there is an exception carved out and remitting of like 1099 specifically for independent contractors. If you use a payment system that remits a 1099 for you, you don't have to, um, you, don't, you don't have to go do a separate one, right? You don't have to go pay a CPA to do a separate one for you. PayPal, if you're like paying affiliates or referral fees and stuff, affiliates do, um, I'm sorry, PayPal does remit the 1099, uh, but if you're looking for a more robust system that likes direct deposit, doesn't require your people to have a PayPal plan, Gusto does that as well. I pay myself that way, I pay my ICs, my independent contractors and employees, and then it remits all of those documents um, that I, for tax purposes, so that I don't have to worry about it, it's all tracked for me. Keep in mind, independent contractor, again, going back to the status stuff, you can't just call them that, you also have to treat them like an independent contractor. They need to be fairly independent so you don't get swept up in this tax and benefit stuff. Um, we're gonna talk about intellectual property here in a minute, but keep in mind this 1099 type stuff also applies to people that you're giving money to um, that you're not necessarily, they're not necessarily a team member, okay? Um, like referral fees, maybe you have a relationship with another business down the street. Well, they're obviously not doing any activities for you, but you're gonna to need to provide a 1099 miscellaneous in order to track for any $600, over $600 um, in a calendar year. Another thing would be if you're like encouraging your clients or customers to refer and they're receiving a monetary compensation above that $600 threshold as well. Gusto can do all of that so they don't just have to be a team member. There's other systems, I'm just like singing their praises uh, because that's the one that I'm currently using and anything that is easier for me the better, um, very seamless straight line. If I can figure out technology, you guys can definitely um, use this as well. So digging in for the little last tidbit of this, um, it's gonna kind of cross over the type of documents that I think you guys should have, but the intellectual property defaults when it comes to uh, having 
um, independent contractors and employees. Now, I do this a lot in my legal practice. I'm sitting in my office right now, actually. And it's unfortunate because oftentimes you'll have a business owner who believes that they own all the intellectual property, whether it's a software code or it's a logo, uh, maybe it's a blog post, a social media update. They believe that they own that because they have paid this person to create that for them. But this goes back to the statuses that we were talking about before. It's not merely calling someone an independent contractor. It's all about the action and control. So if you are an independent contractor or you have an independent contractor, either way, and the, the work is created for someone else, and we're not talking for a work for hire, we're just talking the default rule here, technically all the intellectual property rights sit with that person. So for example, you as the business owner, go out and you hire a logo designer to create a logo for you, Without any documentation in place that transfers the intellectual property rights over to you, that logo designer retains the intellectual property rights to it. I really see this implicated when you have assistants that are working in your business and they fall into that independent contractor camp. Maybe they're like virtual assistants that do one-off type jobs. Um, you have second shooters or associate shooters which is debatable on really the definition for that for photographers, but really with second shooters this happens a lot. The biggest pitfall here that is really scary for me, not just that you don't have ownership, that's a big thing because like for in the logo example, if I don't have the logo rights to it, me as the business owner, okay, I can't take that and defend it if someone's ever um, or enforce the rights on it because I have no rights. I'm only really a licensee at that point of using that logo if all the intellectual property rights have remained with the designer, with that um, independent contractor. I only have a license to use it, which means multiple things. One, if it's ever used um, by another business or so forth, I have no enforcement rights on that. And two, technically that intellectual property owner, that logo designer, absent any agreement, can stop me from using that logo at any time. That logo is not in your asset bucket. You don't have any control. You merely have, if there's no documentation, um, this implied license to use it. Okay, so that's just something really big you guys need to think about. That is the most common one I think that can reach across all of the different industries that I have watching right now. Keep this in mind, it's so super important. Um, this can happen software code when stuff's created for your website. Um, and again, this could be images of creating, marketing materials, blog content, whatever it is. So, since I've shared that with you, what is the best practice for this? For me, no matter if you're an independent contractor or you're an employee coming in the door, I automatically require that you sign all intellectual property rights over to me. Now, it makes it sound like I'm such a hard ass, right? Like I'm just gonna require them to sign it over. It's a discussion, it's outlined in the job description that everything that they create is going to be owned by me. That's not to say when I have a logo designer that's signing over this intellectual property rights, that's not to say that I'm not gonna license her the right to use that in her portfolio. I'm totally cool and open with that, right? But I don't want her being able to have the rights to it that keeps me from trademarking, that keeps me from enforcing any rights because I would have no rights if it stayed with her. Um, that is so that I can maintain my brand value, the intellectual property assets. So as soon as they come in the door, intellectual property acknowledgement is the first thing you sign. Because like the example that I gave earlier, when I talked about the control factor, you can have someone who's an independent contractor, but the more that you guys truck along and you start having more control over them, you may wake up one day and realize they're an employee, right? Um, you never started giving a W-2, you may have never signed an employment contract. That does not really matter in this case. Um, and so while it's good that under the employee status, anything an employee creates for your business is yours, but even there, I just want to ensure that all the lines are straight, they sign a document, whether you're an IC, whether you're an employee coming in the door. And so the intellectual property acknowledgement is first, I'm making sure that I'm paying them, um, that we have all the terms outlined. This is why it's really important you guys do have a document no matter if you're an IC or an employee, how much they're gonna get, get paid when, and the method of payment, uh, which can you guys can do like PayPal or Square, I believe, and then there's Gusto that does direct deposit, um, 
There's all sorts of systems that you can use for that as well. Um, a couple other things, if they're going to be coming in contact with your client list or pricing information or other proprietary stuff, have them sign like a non-solicitation agreement, confidentiality, uh, these little different documents you guys might not necessarily think about, but you need to have on the front end because you don't have an issue till you have an issue, and it's really hard to put things back. For the biggest example is like these logos. Don't freak out if you guys are thinking, oh my God, I don't have the IP rights to my logo. They can stop me from use. I can't trademark it. I can't do this. You can go back and talk to them, to the graphic designer, and see if they'll sign it over now. It's not all lost because you didn't do it, but just consider you might get some pushback. And I know for the photography industry, this sounds a little kind of weird talking about getting the rights uh, for these type of assets. It, this is why when it comes to commercial work for the photography stuff, it is not unheard of for rights to be transferred over at all when it comes to commercial nature business. If someone photographs for my business, right? Um, this is also why licensing agreements are way more robust as well when it comes to commercial stuff. So don't think I'm a senior advocating just for all this rights grab, must have, must have. Think of it from a business owner's perspective and what are the key things, software, logo, marketing materials, blog content, any, any content created that you want to be yours. Make sure you determine the status, um, how you're obviously how you're going to pay them and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but also determine these intellectual property defaults and make sure you put the right documentation in place. Um, we work with this a lot in my business. Um, I have my own firm with my partner, Andrew. Connors and Brinky. Um, you guys can find us at connorsandbrinky.com. I also have more information that expands this out on the applicable blog sites for photographers. At, it's at thelawtalk.com and then more general stuff at rachelbrinky.com and there's the podcast as well. Just keep in mind that I need you guys to sit down and think about all of this because doing it now before the end of the year will also determine what you're going to do next year. Maybe you're making that thought in your mind of, oh, you know, I've had this really good assistant. I might want to make her an employee. What, you know, what are the steps I need to do? What are the things I need to think of? I just gave you a checklist. Or maybe it's in the inverse. You already have people working for you and you're thinking, I don't really know what's going on here. Half of what I just told you, or maybe all of it you didn't truly understand, use it as a checklist. Determine their status. And then kind of as an offshoot, if it's like a referral fee program or business networking type referral program or affiliates, make sure you're doing, if it's over that $600 threshold, how you're going to pay them, how much you're going to pay them, when you're going to pay them, um, and then also all of these intellectual property defaults as well as non-solicitation and confidentiality to keep all your proprietary information private. So if you guys have any questions, you can throw them into the live chat and let me go ahead and take a look. All right, so somebody asked, my husband is doing our website and pays developers. So I pay his business for the services since he is paying his team also. Do I need to 1099 my husband? Anybody that's doing that type of work, yes. And the good thing about it is when you remit the 1099, you're telling the IRS a couple of things. You're telling them that not only did you not profit that money, but you're, or like take that money and pocket it. That's the word I'm looking for. Pocket that money. You're also identifying that those people receive the money. So it works twofold. It puts the IRS on notice that you didn't pocket it and then also designates that those individuals need to claim the funds as well. Keep that in mind if you're using an online system, like I said before, PayPal, as long as it's sent by send money, but not friends and family. Do not use the friends and family function. It will not, last I checked, will not account for putting it into their 1099 document that they will receive. Um, you want to make sure that it's clean, straight lines. And like with Gusto, you can't just send money arbitrarily. It's connected to the person. Um, it's connected to the system. And what's great about it is, is that I put the person's email address and it sends them a link um, to log in and they have their own little profile. They can put all their own private information, such as social security card number. Um, I don't see that. Um, Gusto stores all of that for me because um, that's one of the big mysteries of having employees and so forth and reporting of uh, numbers for security. Um, Gusto and those type of systems, I think ADP and all of them, will store all that information for you and allow them to set up their own, uh, what is it called, their own account um, and their own profile so that you're able to designate. And it keeps an electronic cloud backup um, record for you as well. Somebody said, I did not pay my husband to video shoot a wedding for me, but I pocketed the money. Do I need to get on a 1099 and how much do I report? You need to report the amounts 
all the amounts if it's over the $600 threshold. Um, it's a little implicated when it's your husband, but I still would consider that a tenant and I, if you consider either way. It also impacts your specific tax situation. Are you guys a partnership or is he not even on the business? Um, is he an owner of maybe a, an entity such an LLC or corporation? All of that's going to come into play, so just keep in mind this is the general rules. Um, and that's a little implicated, like complicated there. You're more, it's more, uh, more like I have someone who answers my emails for me or creates a logo for me. Um, well, ignore that second part because I could just be products. But when we come into um, second shooters, um, office assistants, those sorts of things is where you really need to focus to make sure you know their status, have all of this, and make sure you're doing the right tax documentation as well. So I think that's all the questions. I have to hop on another phone call, actually, with one of my independent contractors. Uh, and so if you guys have any more questions, stick it into the bottom, and I'd be happy to work on it um, later and answer questions for you guys. Have a good one.